So this is LG's G3, their flagship OLED for 2023. And this is probably the hardest TV review that I have done. And it's not that the TV isn't an improvement over previous models, but it's that it does a lot very well and is very surprising in how much the performance increased over last year. However, while the G2 last year was my pick for best premium TV at a large size, I don't feel that LG did enough this year to maintain that position. So hopefully by the end of this review you'll understand what I mean, but first let's thank Robert Zone of Value Electronics for lending the TV for review. Hello everyone, I'm Robert Zone from Value Electronics. We're a custom integrator and a retailer, premium audio and video products. Classy, thanks for inviting me back on your channel. I always love being here with you. Please stop by and visit our website, valueelectronics.com. We're well-respected in audio and video premium products. Mention to us when you call that you came from Classy Tech and uh, we'll extend every courtesy possible and provide the very best service and prices. Any technical advice that you need, Please give us a call. Thank you, and I look forward to meeting many of Classy's members here. Thank you. So starting with the overall build and design of the TV, I have a previous video that I will link below of the setup and unboxing experience, as well as setting the TV up with the Santa stand that you can see that it's on right now. Overall, the build quality is excellent, as you would expect from the G-Series. It's about an inch thick metal design that houses an internal heatsink to help with the heat dissipation it has four HDMI 2.1 ports at full 48 gigabits per second. Everything that you can expect from a flagship TV, including an ATSC 3.0 tuner. Now I want to move on to some measurements and then getting into the weeds per se with this TV. I have had over six hours of footage in this review that I have trimmed down to try to make it around 20 minutes. There is a lot to cover with this TV and I know most other reviews have been overly glowing and there is a lot to really like about this TV. However, there are some issues that we do need to discuss. So let's get into the measurements starting with SDR. And do note that I am using the ITP formula for the Delta Air and a Delta Air ITP of five average for color is pretty good for out of the box. And this is the filmmaker mode. Now an issue with filmmaker is it is way too bright out of the box at nearly 350 nits and it really should not be that high. So I did lower the OLED light to bring it down to about 150 uh, for this. Other than that, it was untouched. Looking at the grayscale measurements, we can see that the very bottom end of the grayscale is way too dark, which would result in crushing of near black detail. And then also what we're gonna see is a green bump in the lower skin tone range of the grayscale, and we will talk about that more as it does affect every mode. Now with a calibration, Pretty much all of this can be fixed in SDR. Where two and under on IRE is still a bit too dark, but other than that, everything's under a one and a half of ITP air. Moving on to HDR, we can see the peak luminance is around 1360, 1370, with around 210 nits full field. The EOTF tracking is very good out of the box. However, we again see as we get closer to black, it again is too dark, leading to crushed shadow details. And in that lower mid range, we do still have the positive green grayscale air. Once again, with calibration, the grayscale can be fixed. However, in HDR, a 3D LUT is not an option, only a matrix LUT, and that did seem to make some of the colors worse. And we will talk more about the color in HDR later in the video. Now, as we move into Dolby Vision Cinema, we can see out of the box, same issue with the green in the skin tone range of the grayscale and even more significant crushing near black. And with the calibration, while it can mostly be fixed, there is a touch more crushing in Dolby Vision post calibration than there is in SDR or HDR. And then finally for actual peak luminance in real content, using a custom test on the new Spears and Munzel disc that will vary the APL of the screen while measuring a small highlight. You can see we get about 1400 nits peak in a best case scenario. But as we increase the average picture level brightness of the rest of the scene, meaning the scene around the highlight gets brighter, we do see more drops and we can see that it drops as low as about 600 nits in the highest APL scenes and this represents how aggressive the ABL of the TV is. So overall, this represents approximately a 40% brightness increase over last year's G2, which is probably one of the largest increases for year over year improvement in luminance. Overall, the TV does get very, very bright for not just for an OLED, but 
for any TV currently. While LCD models with mini LED or full array local dimming can measurably be brighter, a lot of the time that local dimming is also restricting itself. So in actuality, in real content, the G3 is as bright as any other TV available in the majority of scenes. Only the highest of APL scenes will certain LCDs get brighter. When it comes to color in HDR, the panel has not had an increase in color gamut. It's still around 75% of BT2020. However, considering most content is graded within the P3 color space, which this has essentially full coverage of, there's no problem there. And only at the outer edge and the highest luminance do you start to see some drop in that color. So overall color is also far improved over the previous WRGB OLED models. However, as you do approach that very edge of P3 and with high luminance, that is where QD OLED still will show its strength. However, there are other positives to QD OLED over this WRGB panel. And while the G3 using MLA or micro lens array has greatly improved its overall performance over its predecessor, the G2, it does still lag behind QD OLED in a few key areas. The first, as I just mentioned, was the color luminance is obviously going to be higher on a QD OLED as well as the color gamut. And then the overall luminance stability and lower ABL or being able to maintain bright highlights in high APL scenes still remains an advantage on QD OLED, but the biggest advantage for QD OLED has to be the uniformity. So uniformity while being improved over the G2 is still an issue with the G3. And there are multiple aspects to panel uniformity, starting with the vertical banding, which is still a panel to panel lottery. And then we move into the tinting of the display. And especially on the 65 inch size, where it is most noticeable, you do see that there is still tinting issues. If you do take a picture of a white screen at an extreme angle where no one's going to be viewing the TV from to begin with, then you will see that it stays mostly white compared to prior models and doesn't turn to full pink. However, if you view it at a couple seats over from center, you really start to see the pink on the left. And if you are centered, you do still see some issues where it can be cyan, pink, white, to the point that it even causes actual measurable error. So measuring different areas of the screen in both 2000 and ITP formulas, we can see large errors. And then if I just focus on the left third and the right third, we can see while the center is calibrated and very accurate, the left and right sides have very noticeable errors. With the right side being an increase in delta error of around two average and the left side being an increase of around four. Now, most people probably not too big of an issue and especially if it's your main display and you're not comparing it to something else, you probably won't notice it. It also varies on panel size. If you get a 77 inch, the errors while still there will not be as bad as they are on the 65. Moving on from that, I wanna talk about some handshake issues that I experienced and just overall bugs and usability. This will not affect everyone and chances are you won't experience this. However, I did, so I do wanna report on it. You can see I got static a lot of the time, turning off deep color seemed to fix it, but then you couldn't use certain features in HDR and such, so that's not a solution. Also, I've had issues with different inputs being incorrect, like here the Xbox is plugged into the AVR going to HDMI 2, not going into HDMI 3 like it says. There's also issues where it will show a DVD player connected and repeat itself showing multiple of the same HDMI port saying DVD player when that's not the case as there is no DVD player connected. Just random weird issues like this and this is stuff that the G2 suffered and prior LG models suffered as well until they eventually got fixed with firmware updates. I also had the issue with the Xbox where it would fail handshake going into HDR and then you would have to go back to the dashboard and relaunch the game over and over. But again, these are random issues that you may or may not experience. Moving on to reflections. So in SDR with the brightness down at night level, you can see a lot of reflection coming through. Of course, you can also see how the reflections turn a reddish purplish color, uh, kind of reminiscent of the first gen QD OLEDs last year. But now as I increase the SDR brightness going into different picture modes, so if I go to ISF bright, I have it set to approximately 300 nits and then cinema is full SDR brightness. 
with peak brightness on high. You can see it really does mask out that reflection quite well, uh, especially in the brighter scenes. Of course, darker scenes, no TV is going to be able to beat a reflection. And while there are complaints about the black level being raised with ambient light, not just on this, but also on QD OLED, it's really a non-issue for a couple of reasons. The first being your eyes will still perceive black when there is light in the room and it's not quite fully black. As long as it's very dark, your eyes won't be able to distinguish the difference. Then the difference between the G3 and a QD OLED is a QD OLED will spread the light through the entire panel, while on the G3, most of that light will only spread out so far and then stop, so the entire panel does not raise. Now, moving back into what I was discussing earlier with that green bump in the grayscale, that area where that happens is where the skin tones are. So when watching content, if you are used to either an accurate display or your TV does not have an overly blue out of the box look that you have currently when you go to the g3 you can be seeing skin tones and other things in that range and the green will stand out green is the worst of the colors to have a positive air on it is what our eyes are most sensitive to also when watching dark scenes or dark content because of the tv being too dark near black you do lose out on a lot of shadow detail and again compared to what you possibly have now that may be more noticeable to you. All right, now we're gonna go into some processing and with low bitrate content, the G3 excels very well. And then moving on to motion, again, no issues with motion, very clean. And if you are someone who does use the true motion or motion smoothing, motion interpolation type features, again, it's very clean with less artifacts than most other TVs. Now, as with all sample and hold displays, panning shots can exhibit some motion issues for some people. However, this is definitely still one of the best available displays. Moving on to smooth gradation, there is some gradient handling minor issues, I would say. However, using low smooth gradation, you shouldn't have any issue. As far as sharpness, clarity, detail, it's all excellent at 4K with no visible artifacts. And even at HD being upscaled, it is very clean overall. Again, now going back to the motion with a synthetic test, we can see the cinematic movement, natural and smooth movement are available options, or you can use your own setting in a 10 point scale. Now, as you increase the interpolation, it will cause some artifacts. However, in real content, those artifacts are harder to see than they are on this pattern. Using a de-jutter of one is very similar to what cinematic movement is. And then for natural, it is very similar to about a seven. Now, most people will probably be fine if you are someone who will use the interpolation setting, setting it to about a two or a three or just using the cinematic movement. However, in high contrast areas, you can still see some shimmering in the motion when there is panning, unless you have de-judder all the way up to seven or use the natural setting. And the de-judder will be the interpolation effect for lower frame rate content, so 24, 25, 30, D-Blur is a setting for higher frame rate content at 50 or 60 hertz, like some sports would be. So if you're trying to adjust for a movie, doing anything with D-Blur will not help you, it will not do anything. Only the D-Judder would. However, if you want to see it natively how I would, you just turn off True Motion and use Cinema Screen turned on, and you're good to go. As long as you're using a device like an Apple TV or something that can match frame rate of the content so it's not being displayed at 60 hertz. With the luminance loading test on the Spears and Munzel disc, we can see the ABL in effect. As the white gets larger, it does get dimmer. Another good thing with LG is there's absolutely no clipping to worry about out of the box as long as you're in one of the accurate modes. Now in Dolby Vision, you have the option of Cinema and Cinema Home. Cinema Home will be a overly brightened option that is not accurate, but it is designed to be used with the AI brightness turned on to be Dolby Vision IQ in a bright room. However, it's still not going to be accurate. However, if you are watching Dolby Vision content in a very bright room, it's designed to brighten up shadow areas to make it more visible. New this year is an expression enhancer setting. Again, this is not for accuracy. And if you do use it, the detail setting will lower the brightness in the lower mid range and the brightness setting will raise the brightness in the upper mid range. 
using this with dynamic tone mapping on HDR can result in a very bright image for a very bright room or if that's your preference. If that is something you want, I would suggest using the cinema home setting in HDR10 as that is going to be the brightest mode with dynamic tone mapping turned on. And if you are looking for accuracy and you're using Filmmaker, dynamic tone mapping on is not accurate and it will need to be turned off. Looking again at cinema and cinema home with real content in a show, you can see how it over brightens all aspects of the image with cinema home. Now what I want to try and show is going to be quite difficult to see, but this is post calibration with HDR10 versus Dolby Vision in a very, very dark scene. Overall, it is extremely similar and very close. However, if you look at the areas that are the darkest but not quite black, you can see less detail with the Dolby Vision, more detail with HDR10, and that is trying to show how I showed with the measurements earlier that after calibration, Dolby Vision continues to crush some detail near black. This is something LG has been made aware of, so whether it is fixed or not, I can't say, but it's possible that it could be. Now we're gonna move into some gaming, and we can see if we look up into skies, especially at 120 hertz, how color gradients are an issue and there is posterization in the sky and it is quite noticeable. We can see color rings banding throughout pretty much the entire sky, regardless of if you're in game mode or the other modes when ALLM is on. And then the smooth gradation feature does not work in any of these modes when auto low latency is on. This has been an issue with LGs for years, so don't expect anything to change with this. Uh, then something that I have gotten requests about is to try and show VRR flicker more. So here is loading into Sea of Thieves. If you look especially around the edges of the screen, uh, this is a prime example of when the frame rate is constantly fluctuating with VRR on. You do get VRR flicker. However, this affects all VRR displays, so it is not anything negative towards the G3, but there has been requests to show it in the reviews. So now we're going to move on to another issue with color and if you look at the bottom here this is measuring p3 saturation at the typical measurement of 50 percent stimulus and it looks as you would expect which is pretty good however as we measure lower stimulus or lower luminance in the colors we do see it really starts to fall apart this is a quite noticeable issue in content and it affects all picture modes in hdr and dolby vision it just does not do well with lower luminance color and with no 3D LUT ability in HDR, there's no way to correct it. Now on the other side, when you go even higher, so up to 70 or 75% stimulus and are measuring P3, this is where things get interesting. In game mode, you do not get the boosting of the color luminance like you do in the non-game modes. So as color gets towards the outer edge of the P3 color gamut and is supposed to be bright, in game mode there is a significant difference compared to being outside of game mode. In previous models, there has always been a discrepancy in how the game mode was to keep input latency low. However, with the G3, that difference is much larger and much more noticeable. And because someone will ask, Dolby Vision game mode, even with a calibration, cannot be made accurate, and I do not recommend using it. So as a demonstration, that's going to be a little hard to see. If you look at this table around the flickering light of the candle, you can see where there is banding and rings of different color that is basically pulsating that is from the low luminance saturation issue and i do have a youtube short showing that a little bit better next to the s95c and then if we look into this fire we can see the issue with the game mode not being able to push the color luminance as much and filmmaker is calibrated using a hard clip to mimic what hgig does and game mode is also calibrated as well now an issue that is if, if your TV is not calibrated and you are in a mode that's not game mode, then your tone mapping is gonna go up to 4,000 nits. And if you set a lot of games to 4,000 nits, then your shadows are greatly raised and you don't have really good darks in your games anymore. It also means your highlights won't be as bright and defined as they are in game mode using HGIG. So while you do get color luminance, you do have other sacrifices that you have to make. Also using dynamic tone mapping to on has a great impact on the color. So when I switch to cinema home, that is set to dynamic tone mapping on. 
Cinema is set to a regular roll off and Filmmaker is set to the hard clip. So as I toggle through here, you can see what's happening. Now some games will have the ability to increase the brightness of highlights without affecting the rest of the image or the shadows, but it's pretty, say, mixed 50-50 probably, uh, at least for the games that I have tested. So some games you should be okay, and then other games it probably wouldn't be that great to use Filmmaker mode. Also, whenever you are outside of game mode, you have to have an ALLM supported device and have ALLM turned on, otherwise the input lag would be way too high. But even with ALLM on, outside of game mode is going to increase input lag a little bit. It's around one frame of added lag. There are no input lag testers that support ALLM or even VRR at this point, so it is kind of difficult to say for sure other than to use a camera and count the frames. So now for the next couple minutes, I'm going to play through the opening video of Gran Turismo here, showing game with HGIG enabled on the left. This is how most people would typically play the game with Filmmaker calibrated with a hard clip, which would be your best case scenario uh, in the upper right. And then at the bottom, for the people who do like to use dynamic tone mapping, I have it set to Cinema Home, which this is not going to be accurate, so you will be able to see where the highlights get blown out or where the colors get weird. Things can happen with it, but also your shadows get raised, things like that. Uh, game HGIG, you can see where the color luminance is just not pushing as much as it possibly could be. Uh, with the Filmmaker hard clip setting that is using... Calman to upload a custom tone curve to the TV so that it does hard clip at its max ability and it is the most accurate best way to play if that's an option but if it's not and you are using Filmmaker out of the box without that uh, and your dynamic tone mapping is set to off then the details and the highlights would not be as defined and it would not be quite as bright in the highlights having to tone map from 4000 nits and then again that in some games can affect the midtones and shadows depending on the game and if it's able to separate the highlight brightness from the rest of it. So pretty much what all this boils down to is if you buy the TV and you're going to use game mode, your color brightness is not going to match the ability that the TV can do outside of game mode. And because there's such a stark difference now, uh, it is a bit more visible than it was in the past. And if you are able to get the TV calibrated, uh, as long as the calibrator knows uh, about this and knows what to do, you can use, say, Filmmaker or Cinema Mode uh, to pretty much get around it. Again, you will have a slight increase in input lag by doing so, but that will give you the full color luminance that the G3 can do. However, without that being an option, it is unfortunate that there just really is no optimal solution for gaming with the G3. And if we look here specifically at the highlights themselves, we can see there's not a huge difference in highlight brightness. Um, again, this is toggling between the hard clip with Filmmaker, normal tone mapping, dynamic tone mapping, and game mode with HGIG. So we can see there's changes in the highlights and you know how blown out they get. However, the actual highlight brightness between game mode and outside of game mode is relatively similar, not as noticeable as the measurements would say. It's the color luminance is the real issue. Here I'm trying to show the difference with the input lag when switching between game mode and a different mode while using auto low latency. Again, it's very, very slight for most people. This should be absolutely fine. Do keep in mind that end-to-end -end latency in most games is around anywhere from 50 to 150 milliseconds. So one more frame is not that big a deal. However, on the Nintendo Switch where ALLM is not supported, uh, then in a situation like this, the input lag is much more noticeable. Um, hard to say exactly how much more it's, but it is around at two to three more frames of input delay. Some people probably still be okay with it, but the only reason you would want to do that on the Switch is if you wanted to increase your luminance more as an SDR. In game mode, you're limited to about just over 300 nits. Uh, because game mode does not let you use peak brightness and when it's at 100 OLED brightness It's still not as bright as other modes now if you do have a LLM on and you're in SDR You still can't use the peak brightness setting 
However, going to 100 OLED brightness in a different mode is brighter than game mode, so you can get closer to about 400 nits or so, which with the S95C above calibrated so that it's not clipping, it's not that far off of being as bright as that in SDR gaming. Other comparisons comparing the SDR brightness like that in gaming uh, usually don't have correct exposure and also contrast is set too high so it is clipping. Once that's corrected, next to the S95C, of course it's still a little bit brighter at peak in SDR game mode over the G3, when in a different mode besides game mode using ALLM, you can get it pretty close and in most bright rooms it will be more than bright enough for most people. But then completely outside of gaming, going back to TV and movies, SDR on the G3 can get as high as over 600 nits and it is extremely bright, more than bright enough for all but the most brightest of sun soaked rooms. And then when it comes to HDR, this is without a doubt the OLED that can be pushed the brightest, which is saying something that they have a technically out Samsunged Samsung uh, as far as being able to use the inaccurate modes and push brightness and retain contrast better than the S95C. However, in the accurate modes after calibration, it's kind of reversed where the S95C can get brighter in the certain situations where the content happens to call for it, and especially in very bright colors. And finally, we have the Sony A95L releasing later this year, also using QD OLED and also available in 77 inches. So that kind of brings up the biggest issue for the G3 and that's LG Electronics did a fantastic job with the panel that they had given and available to them. However, it just, the panel is still not able to outdo what QD OLED can do. So while MLA certainly helped and improved the performance quite noticeably, uh, it also amplified some of the issues that the WRGB panels have. Also some of the issues that were later fixed and firmware updates with prior LG models have found their way back into the software of the G3, so some future updates are greatly needed to fix some of the issues. All of these have been sent off to LG, so they are aware, but whether they get fixed or not is just a matter of time to find out. Some issues, such as the green and the gray scale, could be fixed at the production line in later TVs that come out. Uh, but that will take time to find out as well. These issues have been measured on multiple G3s at multiple sizes and are confirmed to be traits, at least currently, and not one-off issues. Now, the other issue with the G3 is the 83-inch size. It was promised to be an increase in brightness even without MLA. However, that has not been the case. So far, they are just the same as the G2 in terms of performance, brightness, and even the panel. And the panel still is the same that was with the C1 in 2021. So I really cannot recommend anyone buy the 83-inch G3. Instead, save the money and look at the 83-inch G2. And even at other sizes, the G2 being significantly discounted, it's still a more than viable option to consider, at least while it is still available and the G3 is at its launch price, which is kind of its biggest issue at the moment, is that it's trying to compete with the highest end QD OLEDs in terms of price, but the performance, while not too far off, it does have issues that I think should cause it to be cheaper than the QD OLED alternatives, mainly because of the uniformity. That said, many will still want to buy the G3 because it does include a five year panel warranty that does cover the parts at least, but not the labor. The general reliability is quite high or should be quite high based on LG's past record and their ability to release frequent firmware updates to fix issues without causing too many new issues when updating. So this review is now almost 30 minutes, which is much longer than I wanted it to be. However, again, I was cutting down from over six hours of footage and there is just so much to talk about and cover with the G3 because there are so many great things about it and so many things that are not so great. I will have some comparison and other future videos with the G3 uh, that go into a little more depth into certain specific areas like Dolby Vision as well. Keep an eye out for those. Subscribe if you aren't. I hope this video helps you out and if you made it to the end, thank you for watching all of it. So. I hope to see you all in the next one. Thanks.